Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and I have an extra special guest on with me today, Mr. Jeremy Cohen. Jeremy, welcome. Thank you, Walt. Uh, and uh, Jeremy, uh, the last time I interviewed you, as you said, it was 2013? Uh, 2016, yeah, ten, uh, eight six, years ago. Yeah, eight yeah. years ago. And, uh, uh, and uh, Jeremy, let's put the first slide up, Chris, is, is Boston's and the country's dog lawyer. <laughs> and, uh, and here is the front of the Globe magazine uh, uh, from, what, three, three years ago, something like that, uh, four years ago? It, actually, uh, I mean, it was about, months ago, I mean. It was say, um, about two weeks ago. Two weeks yeah. ago, yeah, yeah, I meant to say weeks, yeah. So, so that, that's you there. I don't know how they got you into that water. <laughs> I, I hope they paid you for the suit that you were to get I into that salt I have my ocean water. suit now. Oh, you, <laughs> anytime we're going to get together with dogs, I have a special suit. Well, and, and as, as you would expect, we're going to be talking to Jeremy about his practice, which is uh, actually uh, revolutionary because there was really nothing, nothing like it until Jeremy kind of put it on, on the map, and that is representing animals and animals' owners in the courtroom. Um, so uh, just to get a little bit of background, uh, give us a little bit of background. You, you were born in Revere and tell us, you, you went to, to, to law school. Tell us about that. Went to law school in Boston at Suffolk. Yeah. Uh, I, the thing I'm most prideful of is that I worked at Kelly's Roast Beef on the beach for 15 years through high school, college, and law school. I really learned a work ethic there. <laughs> and uh, I, you really learn to have thick skin too. And you're dealing with people who need something right away. <laughs> and that whole community behind the scenes, that was just a ton of fun and a great place to grow yeah, up. Yeah. And as I, as I understand, uh, you were not, you were kind of a, a reluctant person to go into the legal profession. And, and you, you, for a year after you got your degree, your law degree, you still worked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I knew I wanted to help people, but I wasn't really interested in paperwork. Yeah. And um, and then when I got out of school, I I just needed a little bit of time. Yeah. And um, ultimately, working at Kelly's and then my the most important job I ever got, I think, was a basketball coaching job. I always wanted to be a high school basketball coach. Really. And it was through basketball coaching that I ultimately it, there's a direct connection from basketball coaching to my first dog case and. I had, I got the first job I, to coach when um, they interviewed me and said, look, you're going to get the job to coach here. It was at Arlington Catholic High School yeah. just because you're a lawyer. So we trust that you'll be able to drive the van. We don't know about your skills to, <laughs> to work with the kids. Well, <laughs> and, but it's that a left-handed compliment, right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> they could trust me. And, and that led to coaching, which led to meeting some friends, led to meeting my wife, who ultimately uh, – it was her kid's dog that I first represented, Jesse yeah. the German Shepherd. Yeah. I think. Hold, hold on to that. We're going to go into that. But uh, but I, I just want to say that the, uh, the first couple of legal jobs you had, uh, you you worked for a division of GE as, as a, a, a insurance lawyer, and then you ran a collection agency. So they weren't too in, inspiring, were they? Those, no. Uh, and I was really not even a lawyer for uh, electric insurance. I was more of a, a manager, a claims adjuster, but. They didn't really utilize my law degree because I wasn't yeah. opting to utilize it. So yeah, I was, I was not a happy lawyer. I was not a successful lawyer by by any measurement yeah. in my mind. So in 2008, let's go back to the okay. Jesse case. And so your legal life took a drastic turn uh, with a dog named uh, Jesse. So uh, we're going to put a picture of Jesse up. Oh, there and he so is. tell us tell yeah. us the, the history of of Jesse. What happened there? With Jesse, he had a tendency to to run after little dogs, especially when he would go from the car to the house or from the car into, from the house into the car. That's where a lot of pet owners they they let their guard let down. The guard down, yeah. And if the dog sees a trigger, as Jesse would, these small dogs, he would chase them, and he had bit a few. And on this particular day, uh, Jesse was with my stepkid's dad, and and he bolted. And he went after a small dog, and a woman went to protect the dog, and he bit her in the calf. And so the, the local town held a hearing um, at which they brought in 30 or 40 people who I said, I'll go and see what I can do. I mean, I don't think Jesse, I've never been to this. I don't know if Jesse's a, a bad dog or not. And they voted to kill him. Yeah. And that really astonished me. And I couldn't believe how quickly they got to this decision without any 
any yeah. real facts or evaluation. Yeah. And the big angle here that you use, in fact, well, let's, let's back up one more. Yeah. You actually called F. Lee Bailey, you got to know him somehow, but you actually called the famous, world famous F. Lee Bailey, and, and you asked him for advice, and he said no. Right? Right. So, but uh, you persevered anyway. Yeah, I was so crushed when I called him. <laughs> My first call was to, to Lee, and he's like, did the dog do it? I said, well, yeah. He said, then there's no defense. Said, that's yeah. not... So, That's not F. Lee Bailey. So but you, the angle you used was very clever and, and something novel. So tell us what, what you did. As, as pet owners, pets are property. And we've all heard the government cannot take your property without, or life, liberty, or property without due process. And due process is a fair hearing. Yeah. So any, these towns that want to take your dog, if, if your dog bit somebody or allegedly did, you are entitled to a fair hearing where you know the charges against you, you know what to defend against, and you get a chance to put on an adequate right. defense. So, so he w the, the dog wasn't getting due process, right. basically, right? Exactly. And that's what you argued. And in the end, you won. We won. And um, <laughs> it made the local paper. There was a great cartoon, Will It Be the Black and Tan Mile for Jesse? People really got behind it. Yeah. It was a, such an exciting time for me as a lawyer because... Nobody ever really cared about the work I was doing until now. Yeah, and and then uh, I, uh, eventually Jesse came to live with you because yeah. he was not allowed in. He, he was from Marblehead. He was right? from Marblehead. He was banned, banned from ever going back. So and um, you took him in. And on his last day, ultimately he lived five or six more years. On yeah. his last day, uh, it was time to put him down because of cancer. We we got him uh, an ice cream and we drove through Marblehead and uh, made a little stop at the police station just to say, hey Jesse. Yeah, this you can is, go back to Marblehead. Wow, wow, that, that that's a phenomenal story. So, uh, basically, this started you on a new career, and your 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 legal career just took a jump because you you. Uh, what was going on in your head with this? What what made the big change? You, you... Well, I I I always wanted to differentiate myself, but I never found a way. And suddenly, suddenly there was no right way to do this and no wrong way, and. And I started getting calls, so I would take a few a year, and I found it wasn't work for me. It was this passion, this fire was lit where I really believed in these cases, and I really believed there was something wrong besides just the behavior of the dog. It was the way towns and authorities were viewing the dog. Right. And yeah. it just wasn't right. Now, all we've done is dusted off law from the 1800s and 1900s about property, and made it apply to right. dogs. Now. And we're going to cover a couple of those cases where, where you did just that. And now, uh, so that changed your life. So now Boston Dog Lawyers came into existence. Chris, can we see the next uh, image? <clears throat> so here you are with some of your clients. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, are, were those dogs actually all your clients? Or uh, a few of them were. Yeah. Um, JoJo's on the far right, the Great Dane. Um, there's my Maisie on the far right. Uh, well, I guess on the far right of that picture is Maisie, Joe's yeah. on the far left. Yeah. And then there's um, Rosie was also a client. And then um, little Bubka just showed up at the day we were shooting at the beach and Bubka's in my <laughs> arm. Um, <laughs> Good prop, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Good that prop. was a great day. Yeah. They were, those dogs were great. And, 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 and again, this is from the, the article that, that ran in the, in the Boston Globe magazine, which you say have t has taken on a life of its own. And I want you to pick up... Uh, just yeah, hold, sure. just hold that uh, uh, up. Let's see, uh, just like that, and uh, uh, it's it's this week's National Enquirer, National the September thirtieth issue. And where, just open um, it up there in front of you, and uh, they've actually so, done a non-scandalous story on on Boston dog lawyers in my practice. So, so it's not being on the cover of the Rolling Stone, it's being in the National yeah. <laughs> Enquirer. That's the big... Uh, <laughs> That's, that was the next step. And, and this has all led to several calls from, from production companies that want to investigate doing a, a, a reality show, a, oh a, a documentary. Someone even pitched me a sitcom about Boston dog oh lawyers. Oh my so God. It's fun, it's fun. <laughs> well, now, I, I, uh, your, your success, uh, uh, admittedly, is a lot, of, a lot of people's attitudes towards dogs have changed in the last few decades. Um, uh, you know, the, the uh, abuse, it used to be a misdemeanor if you abused an animal. Now it's, it's a felony. It's a big deal. Yeah, and vets, of course, have to report potential or suspected uh, sure. dog abuse or, or, or animal abuse. And there's confinement laws on farms yeah. and things like that. So uh, in the background of that, 
this kind of let you do what you do because the attitudes have changed a little bit, correct? Right, it, it really did come together. Without social media, without the change in attitude towards dogs, um, this, this all couldn't have happened. And the thing about the laws you cite is it's not just about physical abuse, now it's about neglect too. If your dog gets too fat, too thin, the law in Massachusetts especially considers that a felony too. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot that pet owners have to watch out for now. Yeah, I saw a funny cartoon just recently where uh, it was, you know how you see these billboards for, for lawyers like, have you been injured in yeah. a, whatever? And this one is directed towards dogs. And it says, has your owner crack the treat in half and given it to you as a whole treat, <laughs> you may be entitled to compensation. It shows this dog. That's <laughs> excellent. <laughs> That's pretty funny. That's where we're headed. Yeah. That's great. Now, now, also what's happened uh, is, uh, maybe you can comment on this, law schools have started to put in courses specifically on, on uh, animal uh, laws and all, yeah. how to, yeah. They have, and when I was in school, there was one course, I, I didn't take it, I, mean, I never envisioned yeah. this, but now they do have, have professors that teach this. I'll, I come in and guest lecture. I even guest lecture at Tufts Veterinary School because they even want veterinarians to understand the, the scope of what pet owners consider uh, disputes and things like that, how to avoid those disputes. So everyone's trying to learn now the new playing field of pets. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm gonna go over a few uh, specific cases that, I, that I've picked out that okay. I thought illustrated some good points. A, a very simple one was a dog named Midnight. Yeah. Do you remember that? Oh, and yeah. uh, so tell us about tell us about Midnight. There was, uh, you know, he, he never got to tell his case until you uncovered what the situation was. Tell us it, about that. I just spoke to Midnight's owner again. That was in 2012. Mm -hmm. And she told me Midnight lived for six more years and they, how grateful they were and how meaningful what I did was. And it's easy to forget this over the years, but just, just to impact one person was more satisfaction than, than I had in, in all my prior career. And with Midnight, Midnight was, Midnight was uh, accused of biting a boy, actually the, more in the chest than the arm. Yeah. And the, the local city voted to rehome Midnight, which is what you could do back then, you can't do it anymore, which is the equivalent of a death sentence because you, it's very hard to rehome a dog that has a bite history. So the owners were going to have to when they couldn't find somebody, ultimately, if, unless they wanted to move, put Midnight down. And they called me and I went to the next layer of hearing, we appealed it to the court, and I learned, because I've put a team around me now where I've become so much more knowledgeable. Where, detectives, right, dog detectives. Yeah, dog detectives, dog behaviors. <laughs> Elementary, my dear Watson. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes. Yeah, so, so tell here, us about Midnight. It turns out that each day home on his way home from school this boy with some friends they would throw rocks at midnight when she yeah. was behind a, a, a chain link fence yeah. and I found that out animal control never investigated yeah. that and at the hearing I said look we know that this dog has a cap has capability of remembering too midnight was capable of remembering you know the sights the sounds the smells and finally on this particular day where she bit him he she was out with her owner on leash and the boy came by oh can I pet your dog and yeah. before she could say no Midnight leapt yeah. on him and bit him, bit him and retreated, sent a message. Don't I mean, throw she, stones at me anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the court agreed with that and they dismissed the case and, and Midnight wasn't uh, required to be rehomed, which essentially was uh, a, an overturning of her death sentence is the yeah. way we view it. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, there was another case, uh, Scooby, okay? And uh, Scooby had bitten some, some people but you, you came in, normally they came to you uh, to help them, and you actually blamed them. And they said, what kind of a lawyer are you? Tell us, tell us about them, so, for their behavior, right? Right, the way I go about these cases are, um, there's, some, there's often someone to blame besides the dog. Yeah. It, the, it, mo most dogs, their intention is not to bite and to attack. There's certainly some dogs that after trying different methods of training or behavioral modification, they, they might need to be euthanized. But with Scooby's case and others like that, one thing is we, we have to look to the owners. If I'm gonna take on this case, I wanna know ex what happened over the months beforehand and, and how they were dealing with their dog. And really, is this owner error, manager error? And let's work with them to be better managers. But sometimes we don't wanna blame the victim, 
but you have to also look at what did the victim do before he or she was attacked or the dog that they had was attacked. Right, right. And people do trespass. Dogs do run on other people's property and the, the dog that lives there gets can get um, anxious and territorial. Or people might uh, go up to a dog and, and provoke it. They might, everybody thinks they, they know how to handle a dog and they want to go and pet the dog right away, but you don't know that particular dog. That's and right. there's space around the dog that has to be protected. And in Scooby's case, I believe um, Scooby's space was invaded, yeah. and and a dog is is allowed to react yeah. in a in a um, and the a owners species never, specific yeah, way. Yeah, and the dog owners just didn't didn't they they actually created an overreactive dog by their behavior, and uh, right. and so you won the case because you promised that the that the owners would take them to special schooling, special uh, right. dog training. And exercises. where Scooby was exactly where Scooby was 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 right on. Uh, 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 on the Cape, right, mm -hmm. right in an area, I believe it's on the vineyard w near the beach. So there had to be a lot of protections put in place yeah. and really getting the board to trust, to trust them, trust the owners. And yeah. I've checked in with them. I've checked in with the trainer, Rick Alto, and, and things are going well. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, since then, uh, we all know Cesar Milan or anybody who has a dog, I think, has watched the sure. Cesar Milan. He's had several shows on. And one of the shows is better person, better dog. And he basically says, I don't train the dog, <laughs> I right. train the person. Because uh, my wife says, you know, 99% uh, of the problems with, with dogs is with the person that, that owns them. And you, and you actually proved it with this, right. with this case and set a legal precedent, which is, which is fantastic, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, this, this is a very interesting one because uh, something has just happened within the last week uh, as a result of this case. This is Ollie. Right. And in 2020, right. Ollie uh, was mauled at a daycare a facility, facility where, where the owner, she, she had took him there. So tell us, tell us what happened there. Sure. Well, I get a call once every nine days about a dog being attacked or hurt at a boarding facility. Mm. Fighting Ollie's law, and Ollie was my client, uh, Ollie ended up with over 100 puncture wounds. And Ollie, it, Ollie was in the hospital for a, a while, about a month until he succumbed. This all could have been prevented. Uh, the staff, there was only one person for six or seven dogs. And when it happened, there was a veterinary facility right next door, but the person in charge couldn't bring Ollie there to get help right away because she couldn't, she was told not to leave the facility yeah. alone. Yeah. Simple measures, staff to dog ratio, having more than one person there, having somebody who has a driver's license with a car there would be important. And, and really telling the truth, because we didn't know what happened initially, the owner didn't to Ollie, so um, to have to bring it to the doctor to do a quick assessment, a triage, uh, it cost over $20,000 to try to keep him alive. Wow. And we had the right client, very uh, articulate, and she put together this great group of, of state legislators, veterinarians, lawyers, and um, and, and lobbyists. And you were, you were on that Yeah, that, on Always Law well Committee. Yeah. It took three years, yeah. and uh, it was embarrassing at first how the legislature would not, un would not uh, uh, address this. And then the different factions, Walt, who fought this, these groups that we've all heard about who we think are pro-animal, and you find out their real agenda. But finally, the governor signed this last Friday, so that we're super right. fortunate. And, well, the, the essence, I think, is that uh, these kinds of facilities, doggy daycare, whatever you, you want to call them, uh, before Ollie's Law, uh, and this surprised me, is that they were not required to be licensed or, or there was no oversight or there was no, nobody to, to, to see what they were doing. So any Tom, Dick, or right. you know, Jenny could open up a place like this totally unsupervised. And uh, so, so uh, the, the Ollie's Law is actually called the Act to Increase Kennel Safety, and it does all the, all the things that you, uh, right. that you mentioned. I might mention that uh, my wife and I were talking this morning, and she said, hey, I just heard on the radio that uh, Governor Healy signed Ollie's Law. And I said, well, I know about that. And uh, she said, but I don't, I don't remember, what, did she really sign it? So I, I actually put a call in this morning to Joan Lovely to see, because it, it was uh, in, the, in the Senate, so. I have the copy. You I have, have the sign copy. You have it good. Yeah, you should have you, <laughs> you, have, you should have uh, uh, Joan, you know, autograph her for you or something. Um, so all these law, yeah. Congratulations. Thank that, you, that's, uh, pet owners. If you're going to go to a boarding facility, ask them about all these law. Do they know about it? There's certain 
basic regulations, basic measures they can take so you feel safe. And the number one thing is if you leave your dog there overnight, make sure they have a staff member overnight. Yeah. Sometimes they don't, they they're don't, not they staffed just, yeah. overnight. And, and a lot of times people, uh, it'll be kind of a, a place of last resort because something might happen and they have to leave town right. for a day or, or you know, they live by themselves. And so they're, they're really anxious and they look at the first thing that comes up you know, on the, on the phone or in, uh, under, under a, a search. And real quick, what happens to them is they're on vacation or they're at a business conference and they get the call and they cut the vacation short. And this guilt that comes with a pet owner, the, I hear it. I hear it every day on the phone that why did I go on vacation? Yeah. Why didn't I vet that place better? And it's not your fault. It's not the pet owner's fault. You went in there thinking that the state would regulate yeah. these places yeah. and they're safe. But now... Now they're going to be safer. Well, congratulations on, on that one. And uh, now we have another story about a dog named Buster. And maybe you can uh, tell us about Buster because it involves a, a, a kind of beloved character in, in sure your does. town of <laughs> Salem. Yeah. So tell us about Buster in, in, in that case. So Lorelei, um, the she, love witch at, at Crowhaven, yeah, there, there she is. There she that is, was yeah. a great day. Yeah. Uh, Lorelei, in addition to being... Uh, so prominent in Salem for what she does with witchcraft. She's also a lover of animals and she runs something called Salem Saves Animals. Buster Brown had been in trouble many times for biting dogs, uh, for, for not necessarily people, but he had also, um, a summer back, he, he went after a small dog and ultimately that dog succumbed to its injuries. But Buster had this owner who was repeatedly warned by the Salem police, repeatedly promised that he would use a muzzle and use leashes, but didn't, Never didn't did. quite get it. Yeah. And certainly Buster has a behavioral problem, but there's ways to set him up for success. And Lorelei has found the way to set him up for success and it's through better management. But to get there, we had to go through the Salem police. We had to go to Salem district court and navigate keeping him alive with the right people. And, and someone like Lorelei, Lorelei was able to help get that done. And what this case did for me in Salem District Court, um, there was a time where it, it seemed like the city wasn't taking the work that I do that serious. And there was a judge in court that day that explained to the lawyer uh, who was really saying this case, it's just about a dog and it shouldn't really be given this kind of attention. He, he really explained to this lawyer what I do, how important this is to people. And uh, he put it on trial on a particular day where the clerk said, look, we have five trials on that day. And he said, here's how important this case is. Move those jury trials. We're going to hear this case wow. that day. And that compelled the city to understand the seriousness of it. And we resolved it. And Salem, the city of Salem was great about it yeah. after that. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of people just, who are hearing about what I do are hearing about it for the first time. So there is a little pause in there, in there comments to think, well, is this, a, is this real? Yeah. Are you really doing this? Well, that this? brings the, 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 the idea of the concept of pet value. I think beforehand, pets were like, okay, what's the value of, you know, it was looked at like an asset, like you have a car and the car gets smashed or something like that. But you kind of changed the concept of the valuation of pets. Tell us about that. This was at the appeals court last November and the decision came out in, in March. It's been a great year. It's been a great year to be a dog lawyer. But, um, in this case, it was a custody case about teddy bear, uh, Pomeranian, where two people bought the dog together, cared for the dog, and then split up. And they were sharing the dog back and forth until the, my client, Brett, his, his former girlfriend, said, I don't want to do that anymore. And he went a year without seeing his dog. And our argument to the appeals court was that dogs are of a special value that you can't, that money will not Doesn't. replace. And that... It, there's this unique bond that's created that somebody suffers irreparable harm, emotional and financial harm, more emotional, but you've invested in the dog by not seeing your dog when you're supposed to be able to. In the court, we, we had to jump through eight or nine obstacles and they came out with a decision that has changed the landscape for the country, definitely for Massachusetts. The case has been cited around the country where it said money you can't just say, here's $3,000, I'm keeping your dog. Yeah. That, that it, it's, they stated that a dog is not like a car, because that was the argument we were right, getting against. Right. Depreciated value, just, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. You can't just say, your car was totaled, here's a new Volkswagen, yeah. you're, you're in the, back in the same yeah. condition, because it takes years to build that bond. Yeah. And actually, we argued 
the value of a dog to a person increases over time. It doesn't it decrease, decrease right. because you each have this special language. You've each learned each other so well. And that even two people whose relationship with each other deteriorated doesn't mean their relationship with the dog, the dog should. Right, and right. The, court, the court opened the door for all of that. Wow, that, that is fantastic. Now, I might also mention that, that you have represented cats and horses and pigs and chickens and turkeys and snakes, and I don't think we have time today to go through, <laughs> through all of those. Uh, now, I want you do have a dog of your own right now. Let's take a pic. Let's put that up, uh, Chris. Where's Maisie? Uh, there's oh, yeah. you and Maisie. She loves the camera. Yeah, and how old is Maisie? Maisie is 11 and a half. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. We hear about dogs dying every day at the office, so I've really had to condition myself to to just cherish every day that I have with her. Mm -hmm. 11 and a half is getting up there, but boy, is she important to me. She's the logo, first of all, and, of the firm. And also, I, just to hug her periodically throughout the day and take a break oh, and pet her, so it, it does a lot for me and you, for the staff. You're preaching to the choir when you're talking to me on that, because we, my wife and I have all, I, I had dogs when I was growing, I don't think I've ever had a period in my life, maybe when I was in college where I didn't have a dog. No, what I do you have, have now? We have we have two dogs. We have a we have a pit and we have a uh, a pit boxer mix, and we've had uh, we've had at least one dog, uh, uh, and we've had as many as three dogs during At a time. My, my wife and our absolute dog owner. And when a pet when a pet passes on you, mm. it's I cry. I I'm not ashamed. I, it's 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 awful. It's, it's awful. Tough time. Now you're talking about her being the the model for your uh, for your logo. Let's take a look at the next slide, uh, Chris. And there, <laughs> there, I like the little, the little gavel that, yeah. <laughs> in, in, the dog's, uh, in the dog's mouth. That's you, Boston Dog Lawyers. And um, Chris, let's, let's put up, if people want to contact you, I've got a, a slide up there. So, oh, great. so you're part of Boston Dog Lawyers. That's your address there. You're in Swampscott. Uh, and then your email is office at bostondoglawyers.com dot com and that's your uh, your phone number right there yeah we have uh youtube facebook videos like this show up on our youtube page I, i'm so grateful for the opportunity to be back here eight years later well i'm i'm, I'm tickled to have you i saw that article and i said i know that guy i gotta <laughs> get him on the get him on the show you know I, real quickly, my fifth grade teacher reached out after reading that, and we're going to lunch next week after oh, reading that article. Can you, can you imagine plus, something like that? Plus years oh later. Oh, my God. It's incredible. Well, Jeremy, thank you very thank much you. For, for coming on. I think that, that your success really is, is phenomenal. I mean, w when I hear about your success, it just makes me feel good because I'm such, a, such an animal lover. And uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. All right? And maybe I'll, I'll have you on next time. Oh, well, maybe we'll, we'll interview you when you have your own... Uh, when you have your own reality show sure, or something. Sure. Okay. Well, I'd like to uh, remind our viewers uh, that you've been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.